Yes, hello everyone. Welcome. Welcome all. I'm seeing if I can. Are there any new faces here? V, have we seen you before? Welcome. Well. Okay, so welcome to the new term, the new year, indeed. Swagatam. Swagatam? Who knows what swagatam? Swagatam, otherwise Galos Irtate, I think. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Did I get that right, Chrisula? <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, at the end of the last class, or well, the last um, grammar class, we were we were in the middle of discussing this verse four. Um, so let me just share screen. Hang on, share my screen for you. This is screen three. Share. And let's get back so I can see you all. Right before we before we actually get on to the get on to the hang on I got here sorry ah unscrewments sorry Mr Technology at it again what am I looking for oh, I will have a, have a new one um. Before we get on to the, the verse, we were partway through. There are two questions that um, that arose in the meantime. There was one left undone from last time. And that was this word delicate. Somebody raised the delicate. That was in the context of um, Shanti Deva's Sukumara. Remember, he's rather sarcastically, oh, you delicate little soul. Think you think that a bit of hot water is painful? Wait till you're in hell, Sukumara. And somebody I forget who pointed out that um, within the scriptures we find the Buddha referring to himself as delicate. I was brought up as a as a delicate person and referred to as a delicate person. So I did manage to find that, for example, in the in Buddhist legends where um, Anatta Pindika. An early stage. Oh, I've heard that the Buddha is a, is a very delicate person. Now, in fact, it's a very similar word as used. You remember the word Sukumara? A kumara on its own often means a, a prince or, or a young man. Sukumara. Um, often used of a handsome prince, but sometimes in a slightly sarcastic way, like poor little rich kid, you know, who's so delicate, mustn't do anything to upset him. Hmm? And the word used in Pali, when the Buddha is described as being delicate, I've heard that the Buddha is delicate, is Sukumala. Now, Sukumala echoes the Sanskrit Sukumara. This is the Pali word. But it's probably, as it were, a colloquial distortion of it. Because we actually have the words, the Sanskrit word, Sukshma, which means delicate. Sorry. Yeah, delicate or re refined. It's the opposite of gross, subtle and gross, refined and gross. The op opposite word is stula or audarika. Oh, 
So here we have Pali reflecting in almost like an invented word, a combination of Sukshma and Sukumara into Pali then becomes Sukumala. So the answer is yes, that same word or a variation of it in Pali is used of the Buddha when they're talking about delicate. In other words, um, you know, don't treat him too roughly, don't ask him difficult questions, don't disturb him, that, uh, that, that kind of thing. The, another question arose, hopefully most of you should already know, but it was um, a question raised by Lucie, Lucie Cournoyer, I see you're here. It was on the, yes, hello, Lucie. Um, you were asking me about the, on page 32 of Egenus, what's the real difference in pronunciation between the first line and the second line? It's these, um, I'll hold, hold it up, up to the screen, this line. It's the T and the D and the N with and without the dots underneath. And to the, to the Indian ear, they are entirely different sounds. And as you get used to it, you'll find that they're, you'll find that this, they, they, you, your own ear will become more, more and more refined. The, 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 is with the tongue more against the teeth. And very much as it's pronounced in most languages, certainly French and Italian, and Japanese, I think, karate, you see. Um, it, that's why it's known as the dental, because the tongue is against the teeth. The, the retroflex, that's the one written with a, a sub dot. The tongue is back and it's kind of pointing upward, da, and it's that character, characteristic Indian sound you often hear when um, Indians speaking English. They will often use a da da, but it's a time, hmm? time piece, the da on da sound. But the da on da, da da are two totally diff different sounds for the um, for the na native speaker, just as T and th are two completely different sounds for the for the native Eng English speaker. So th and th are d d different sounds. So if you got that with the tongue pointing more towards the up a little bit behind the teeth, up on the part on the hard palate, that's why one of the words for it is retroflex, which means bent back. Da, because the tongue bends back a bit, not forward into the tongue, th, but back a bit. Da. So, and the same goes for da, 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 and da, da, and also for na, na, na and na. Say parnini, not parnini, parnini. In modern Hindi, the da and the distinction remains exactly as it used to be, two entirely different sounds, save that in modern Hindi, the retroflex na tends now not, not to be pronounced as um, re retroflex. The modern Hindu, Hindu tends to say panini, not panini. But that's, a, that's a, minor, a minor point. So there we are. We'll now get to, sorry, any queries arising out of that? So let me go to, where we are. So this is the verse that we hadn't quite finished last time. I'll just read it to you. So somebody to message me. So udarasya trinam vittam shurasya maranam trinam viraktasya trinam bharya so we hear this na, this trna. You will note, and this is part of Sandhi, that where, where in the word you have a r, 
followed by a n, the n automatically becomes n. So, for example, sorry, the way the way I've written it there for grass is actually plain wrong. There must be a dot under the n. It's just wrong to to omit it. Thrna, as in the word for dying in the same verse. Neuter. If I wrote maranam like that, that is wrong. There must be a dot. Please do not think, oh, it's a mere dot. It's a completely different letter and it makes a completely different different word. In fact, as you know, in, in the De Devanagari script, they are entirely different letters for the n and the n. There is a slightly complex rule of Sandhi. I'll just tell you a little bit about it now. I was asked, um, Kath, Kath, you're there. Um, you were asked me, have I, have I given a separate lesson? Where's the lesson? Where are the videos on Sandhi? As I pointed out to Kath earlier, even a simple grammar, McDonnell Sanskrit grammar for students, has got over 20 pages just giving the rules of Sasandhi. I'd never attempt you know, to, to, I wouldn't attempt to learn them all, let alone te teach them all, all in one go, pick them up as you, as you go, go, go along. One rule is where you get a r followed by a n, then the n becomes re retroflex. That's if it immediately follows. If there's a vowel in between, and by the way, the same applies to the, um, so this true now. So r or a r mid turns a n into a n if it follows, even if there's a vowel in between. Um, so that's where we get, for example, Varna, a, a color or a group, has to be Varna, the R. Also, now a vowel in between. So the vowel A ah comes, but it still make the N. Um, also, if any of the consonants, any of the labials, the gutturals or the labials intervening, for example, um rupa form instrumental rupena because that per even though the per comes in between it still influences the the, the na, rupena now this is one of those cases where you say why are there such silly rules of Sandhi? Let me look at, now look at Ratha. Ratha, a chariot. You know? and the Latin rota, a wheel, is the same word. Instrumental, ratena, the n does not change to n, because an intervening t. Why does it happen? This is one of those cases, don't kind of try and learn this by heart now, but it's one of those cases where you think, why does this rule of Sandhi exist? What's it there for? Why is it happening? And the answer is, if you go into soft focus, if you put the tongue, r -r -n -a, r -n -a, r -n -a, to, when you pronounce the p, the position of your tongue does not have to alter to pronounce a p. You can have your tongue anywhere in your mouth and still pronounce a p. p, p, p. It comes out the same. So if the intervening consonant is not one that needs you to move your tongue, then the r will still affect the n. If, on the other hand, the intervening consonant is one that does require you to move the tongue, like a t, r, 
the tongue has already moved to a new new position, and therefore it does not affect the na. The si rupa rupe na rata ratena, because the tongue has moved from its previous position. I say, don't try to learn all this by heart. It's just like one of these many explanations. The rules appear terribly complex, but it's just what we naturally do do with the mouth anyway. I remember years and years ago, could just be over half a century now, when I was studying linguistics at university for a teaching course, the rules of English phonetics, and they are so phenomenally complex. I hadn't realized I'd been speaking the language as my native language for a quarter of a century by then. I had not realized how phenomenally complex English phonetics was. And we think it's less complex because we just use the 26 letters of the, of the alphabet. Sanskrit is a bit the same, but in Sanskrit, these complexities and variations are actually reflected in the way we write it. So it's just that the script reflects a certain complexity um, to show what is actually coming out of your mouth rather than more abstract writing. And why? It's because of the importance given to the sound and to speech in primitive times, in the earliest times of the Vedas. They didn't write it down for a very long time. They simply re recited it. So when the script came to be applied to the language, they said, ooh, now our script must give a precise indication of what we're saying. That's why you get all this sandhi that reflects what happens on the ground or in, in your mouth. So it's not as if somebody randomly made up com complex rules. These are simply somebody trying to you know, put into writing the complexity of what actually goes on in, in our mouths, which is a lot more complicated than we, than we normally realize. Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Is there any questions? Okay, I hope it's not, I hope your silence isn't too much of a, a baffled silence. <laughs> uh, hello, Brian. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, is it the book um, on the new book or what? I couldn't find in the book here because I, I only have the book um, uh, for introduction to Sanskrit. What do you teach here? Is it not in the book, is it? Sorry, uh, do you mean in, in this book? So I, I didn't don't think I caught your question. Yeah. Is it that in the, that book? I couldn't find anything in here. So are you saying you couldn't find anything in the Thomas Egginus book? Yeah. Where is it? Which page do you teach so you can see it? So which page describes the Sandhi? Yeah. Ah, okay. The rules of Sandhi are quite complex, and so it's introduced bit by bit. There's no one place where it's all, all, all together. Oh, I see. Okay. So um, he very wisely, in my view, has not attempted to throw it all at you at once. However, oh, wow. if you want to look at it all at once, excuse me one moment, I take my headphones off. Thank you. The MacDonnell grammar, Sanskrit grammar for students. I mean, anybody who is feeling very brave can look up the rules of Sandhi, all gathered together um, from pages 10 to 32, so 20, 22 pages of it. And by the way, bear in mind, these 22 pages in Mac MacDonnell's book. Can you, um, can, you, can you show me? Can you show me, please? Can you show me the book? The book, yeah. Um, you write that for me, please. Let me just tell you, this, uh, the S Sanskrit grammar for students. Oh, Sanskrit grammar for students, right. Yeah. Who would the author, author please? And the, the, actually, there's a link to it. Yeah. I've given you a link in my resources sheet. Yeah. Let me just call this up to you, for you. Yeah. Please make sure that you all have it. Sorry, where am I? Come on, come on, resources sheet.
so they can get hidden behind each other. This resources sheet, hopefully you should all have, it gets updated periodically. So Sanskrit oh. grammar, if you look yeah. at under number, it's down to page 18, is it page 18? Yeah. It's getting bigger and bigger. So here we are. If you look down onto the section Sanskrit and grammar on the, the resources sheet, external resources, MacDonnell's Sanskrit, Sanskrit grammar. So if you if you click there, then you've got the uh, the on, online version. It's just a, a, a photo P P PDF online version. It's not a, a digital version because it's taken from um, from an old an old print. Oh, so I can bring it out. Whatever, but it's all it's all there. Oh, all there. Oh, okay. It's, it's all, all all in there. But as we're going through with our study, we'll just do it you know, bit by bit as we as we go, go go along. Yeah. To save you from gross mental overload. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, James. All right. So we're now going to. Sorry, James. Here we are. Uh, Chris Allen. Uh, Chris. Yeah, I'm just uh, a bit puzzled. In the, um, about uh, Trim, Trimam, Grant? Trimam, yes. Trimam. Um, why is the, on the first line, why is the form of it, the second instance on the first line, why is that different from every other occurrence, the other three occurrences? Got a Wusaga rather than an Anaswara? Okay, you're, were you referring to the, the lack of a dot under the M at the end of the first line? Yeah. Okay. Why, why, why is it the case that that particular instance of the, the, the second instance on the first line is different from the, the other occurrences? Okay, was that a typographical error on my part? No, it was deliberate. Um, where you get a word that ends in an, an M. Let me call up my iPad screen now. And you get a word ending in an M. By convention in the D Devanagari script, let's take the word. If you're writing the word on its own, in isolation, it's just trinam, and you write the M in full. Oh, okay. So that's if you're just writing that word on its own, let us discuss the word trinam. Or if it occurs at the end of a sentence, or in verse, if it occurs at the end of a line, it's pronounced as a full. It is the, still the anuswara, but it's it's just written as an written and pronounced as a full m. Okay. And in the Devanagari script, it's um it's written as a full con con consonantal m. So. Right. Yeah. You'll see that I've written it as the full M with the the Virama. So it's not Trinama, but tri, Trinam. Yeah. Where, however, it is followed by another consonant, then it becomes Anuswara and is just written with 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 a dot. Yeah. So which is why we have um Call this back again. Trinam yeah. Vittam and Trinam Bharya, Trinam Jagat. So that uh, that is is correct. And if you can see, I, please. Okay. Can yes, I ask yes, this Mariano. something else? Uh, Nishprasya. Uh, Nishprasya. Yeah. It is a kind of eight, that one. Is it ever written down as a proper eight, or uh, does it always stay that way as a, a, a column? Sorry, you're talking about the first one or the second one? Uh, the second line, Nihisprasya. Yeah. Nihisprasya. 
Yeah, if you yeah. look at the Devanagri, you got the column there, and I was wondering because it is a type of H, is it ever joined together as a proper H in there? Or no, never? the um, this, yeah, sorry, that, that sign. Yeah. I can't remember the name of um, the column. So the the Visarga. Yeah. No, the the vis if the Visarga is. And Ruswara will change its spelling, either written as a full M, if it's at the end of a line or followed by a vowel, yeah. or will be written as a dot if it's followed by a consonant. Yeah. If it's the Visarga, if it is a true Visarga, it, it will always be written as the, 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 those two dots. Okay. Thank you. So it won't change from one to the other in the same way that the Anuswara does. Okay, so that you. is that is correct. Now, now that we're on to the De Devanagari script, these are the things you've got to learn anyway. I am trying to highlight just that, those two dots immediately to the left of my cursor. Yeah. So I'm going to press shift and backspace to highlight it, just the two dots, but it highlights the ni with the two dots. Yeah. Why? Why? Why, do, why won't it let me highlight the two dots on their own? This is built into the electronic system, but correctly linguistically done. And the reason is the when you're writing running script, when you're writing the letters, you can write the letters on their own. But in running script, it treats it as syllable by syllable, as a block. And that is, and so the syllable is ni with the visarga. So the script treats it as kind of one composite unit. And true to form, whoever devised it, devised the software electronically, did it correctly. Mm. It will treat it as, as one, one unit. For example, um, where we got at the end, that's here at the end. If I try to highlight just the year at the end, it won't let me. Because it will treat it as one com composite unit. More obviously so in the case of the sia, because the letters are run together. But even with the visarga after the ne, treated as one unit, so it won't let me highlight, highlight it on its own. So Udarasya Trinam Vittam Shurasya Maranam Trinam Viraktasya Trinam Bharya Nisprihasya Trinam Jagat. Virakta. Uh, what am I looking for? Yeah, let me go back to the We did, I think, touch on this. I forget in what detail um, when we were previously on this line. There's the important Raj, alternatively, Ranj. And this actually gives a wonderful insight into the psychological way, way of thinking. This root essentially is um, in color. And the verbal noun actually is raga. We know the g, j, and k, ch alternation, as in from the verbal, from the root yuj, makes the verbal noun yoga. And I've said before, we, we have remnants of that in English. The most obvious one being but we do it the other way around in English. The most obvious one being the, the verb to speak with a k, but the noun speech with a ch. So it's a remnant of that same rule in the old um, Sanskrit phonetics. And, in, and also we have, you know, breach, sorry, breach, um, break and breach. 
it's that same kacha alternation. So raga, but raga actually also means passion. And it's cognate with our English word rage. In other words, you're getting your whole self, your mind is getting colored by emotion, by a passion or by rage. It's the coloring of the mind. And if you, and anuraga, you know, it's the idea as the, your, the anu, meaning following or in accordance with. So the anuraga is you know, when you are getting attached to something, the anuraga, or an anurakti is, is another way, way of saying the same thing. Anurakti, of course, in um, Sanskrit. If you are, and the past participle is rakta, so if you are vi rakta, vi means apart from, you're standing away from it, you're separated from it. So if you are vi rakta, you are uncolored. In other words, you are dispassionate. It doesn't affect your mind with, with, with desire or, or aversion. So this is now the, if you look at this line, viraktasya means of the person or for the person who is virakta. I'm sorry, all that time I was trying to write, I was writing on my iPad screen and everyone was so politely thinking, oh, we mustn't interrupt the teacher by saying, if you see me making a goof like that, please shout out particularly since I've turned my telephone off so as not to, not to be distracted. Odin used to ping me. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that, chaps. These, these are the words I was writing. So Rajan Ranj. I'm dwelling on this because it's actually very central to Buddhist Sanskrit. And of course, in, in Pali, where we get exactly the same things apply. So Raga, from that same root, rage, breaking bridge. Anuraga, being colored according to or following something else, like attachment to something, anuraga. And virakta, virakta, a person is virakta. He is in the amiable condition of viraga, being, as we're disraged, dispassionate. So our word, dispassionate, passion in the sense of suffering a feeling, a strong feeling, if you are dispassionate, that's exactly the same as the Sanskrit virakta. Exactly that same. You're separated from the passion. The passion may be there, but you are, you're standing back from it. You might, it might not be there at all, or you might just be witnessing it, but without the mind being influenced by it. So, Back to the verse. So, viraktasya, as we discussed before, when in English we'd say, you know, for the generous, wealth is like a blade of grass. For the hero, dying is grass. In Sanskrit, we wouldn't, see, we wouldn't use the dative, we, we use the genitive. It's just you know, the idiom of, of Sanskrit. P -p Pali is the same. So, literally, udarasya tranambitam, wealth is. Wealth is like mere grass for the of the of the generous person. So for the generous person, wealth is trinam, grass, insignificant. Now, viraktasya trinam bharya. Sorry, chaps, this is a little bit patriarchal. Some might even say misogynistic. The editor takes no responsibility for the comment of the text in that, that we're discussing. So. This wonderful word, bharya. <coughs> Normally, well, the usual meaning is just a wife. Now, in English, you see, from the root bri, meaning to support. Not a bit, sorry. Here we are. Bri. To carry. Chrysula. So 
So you're um, you're muted. Unmute. No, no. What signs shall we make when you write and we don't see it? You're... Ah, just just shout, unmute and shout. Sorry, oh, there we are. Thank you, Chrisula. <laughs> Full marks to you. You you stopped me. Okay, bri means to carry, and because of the esteemed native land of Chrysula, who's just put me right, I'll give you the etymology here. Can you see what I'm writing? Yeah. Ferro. <laughs> okay. Ferro. Ferre. To carry or to bear. English to bear. Meaning to, to, to carry. And a burden to bear. Um, from that same root. Now, it also to carry, it also means to support somebody in the sense of you know, maintaining their worldly needs. And indeed, the Latin word to support, portare, to carry, support, to carry from underneath. In other words, you are supporting somebody. It's that same meaning of carry. In the Metta Sutta, verse 2, santus, what the, the ideal monk should be, santusa kocha subharocha. Look at the subhara. Su in meaning here of easy. So subhara, easy to support. In other words, not full of demands. In modern colloquial English, we talk about a, a low maintenance girlfriend, you know, somebody who doesn't make excessive demands on the poor bloke, low, low maintenance. Now, there is the, to make the future passive participle, or like the gerundive meaning, requiring to be done from that same root, Bharya, needing to be supported, requiring to be supported. So just as in modern English, one's wife is sometimes referred to as she who must be obeyed. It's official in Sanskrit that the wife is she who must be supported. That is what Bharya means. So you often see Bharya equals wife, which means requiring to be supported. The idea is that the pati, the, the, the husband, has the obligation to support and protect the wife hmm? and deal with her worldly needs. That makes her the bharya, requiring to be supported. And bharya, just the ordinary adjective, and the feminine, bharya, there we are. That is how we get viraktasetranam bharya, so she who must be supported is grass for the dispassionate. In other words, somebody who is dispassionate, virakta, who is free of the passions, trinam bharya, one's, one's own wife is no more important than grass. Okay, yeah, I say, say the editor takes no responsibility for the way it is expressed. We're simply going through an old Sanskrit verse. And finally, nisprihasya trinam jagat. The root spr, spr. Just means, you know, it's another word for want. It's a less common word. Um, just means wanting or desiring something. And the, with the, if, if you're without something, so write that, sorry, but um, so spri, so ni spri. There's an adjective then. Nispriha means if you're you know, free of wants, free, free of desires. So nisprihasya for one who is free of desires. If you said visprihasya, it would have the same meaning. Nisprihasya, visprihasya means the same. One who is without desires, trinam jagat. 
the world, the world itself is no more important than grass. How does it translate here? Yeah, for the desire free, the world is grass. Can I ask whether Jagat is related to life, the Jai? What, what is the root there? What is the root? Ah, okay. The root actually is. Sorry. Brum, brum. The root is gum. The go, so the Jagat, a reduplicated root. When you re reduplicate a gut, it is done with a j. So jagat is that which moves, that which goes. It's, it's just a way of saying the, the, the world. It's not, not just the physical world, but jagat, the whole of the world and life, that which moves and rolls on, the jagat. Does anyone remember from last time an English word in which Jagat appears in a different form. Uh, juggernaut. Juggernaut, yes. It's, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, come, why won't it let me move the page? Come on, there we are. So. The word nata. Is the idea is the, I, the combination of protector and lord, and the word for an orphan, by the way, when he's lost his parents, is anatta. Somebody like a child who's anatta, who is does not have his pr protection without a protecting guardian. There's anatta. So, okay, Santi, a little bit of Santi coming up here. So Jagat Nata, the world lord, the lord of the world. By Sandhi, that T becomes an N. So the dental T assimilates to the dental N, Jagannatha. In modern Hindi, a final a uh, is not pronounced. So in modern Hindi, it's Jagannath. And it you know, got anglicized to Jagannaut, which is how, how that word has come into English. Right. So mm -hmm. that. Sorry, yes, in go ahead. Naughty, why, why does the A not become a retroflex there? Which N? In Jagannatha? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You tell me why it should. Because the G is got guttural, guttural and before yeah. the, the tongue would be back anyway. No. That, that rule only applies to a R. Okay. Sorry, no, it, that rule applies to R, vocalic R, and SH, retroflex SH. Okay. These affect the following N. Those are the only three consonants that do. And because the, they are all retroflex, R, R, SH, the G is not retroflex. And it, hmm? Okay, thank you. I don't know how you pronounce it. I'm sure you pronounce a G in Italian pretty much like we do in English and like, and like they do in India. I certainly don't bend my tongue back to pronounce a G. It just raises slightly. G. 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 Any more naughty questions before we Excuse proceed? Me. Can I can I ask a question? Yes, please, I, uh, please, Bhante. I, 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 I'm so sorry if you have already explained that. That's right. Uh, yeah. uh, according to your uh, 
word word file udaras is a uh, actually this is a uh, sixth case uh, but uh, it seems to me uh, it's a uh, native should be more applicable to more suitable to understand the meaning but uh, why this is the sixth case here why is it sixth case why is it genitive yes, rather than is. dative sixth case rather than uh, yes, yes. fourth case if you right. haven't explained it already that's uh, okay if, if it's, sorry uh, yeah I think it's just a question of the way it's idiomatically expressed in, in, in the language. I mean, in English, for the generous, wealth is like a blade of glass. We could also say in respect of the generous or in the eyes of the generous, as understood by the generous. There are diff different ways of putting it. The most common would be for, for the generous. It's just the way we happen to do it in, in English. And it's just as a matter of the idiom of, of, of the language, that same concept is expressed by the use of the, of the genitive, by the shashtami, the, the, the sixth case in, in Sanskrit. And it would pr probably mean something like in the mind, of the generous or in the understanding of the generous then uh, uh, well wealth is like grass it's just a question of the way it's Id idiomatically done in in sanskrit and it is the I same in, in in pali as well uh, ha, ha, ha. Uh, just just a simple thinking from the mm. just a simple thinking udarasya the sixth case if sixth case comes the udarasya uh, followed by some nouns so udarasya turnan so that's uh, so just uh, uh, for example barakasya as barakasya as asbaha barakasya asbaha or janakasya janakasya reka ni or the sixth case is a uh, has a function to combine yeah, yeah. You're another noun. So <laughs> that's why it 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 makes me wonder why. Okay. No, nice. actually, thank you very much for raising that 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 point. It's a very very valid point. Ninety nine times out of a hundred, um, as Bhantayushi has just said that when you get the sixth case, what we call in English the, the genitive, followed by a noun, that will mean it's the p p possessive case. So this looks like udarasya trinam vittam. This looks like the generous man's grass hmm, is wealth, which of course makes is, is nonsense. Hmm? Ninety-nine <laughs> times out of a hundred, that's what it. That's what the, the genitive followed by a noun is as. Bhante Yushi has very correctly point, po, po pointed out. There are those occasions as here where it has a different meaning as translated. Wealth is for the generous. Wealth is like a bl blade of grass. Can you linguistically tell udarasya trinam vittam just like um, or shurasya maranam trinam the death of a hero is grass. No, it just it doesn't make, make sense. You can tell by context what it means. So why is the genitive used? As I say, it's just the, the idiom of the language. That's how they, that's how they, they express themselves. And it's very difficult to go, go behind that, except you can interpret it by saying, in the mind of the generous person, wealth is merely grass. Hmm? In other words, he'll give it away without thinking. So we just have to, it's one of those things, it's part, part of the idiom. Mostly Sanskrit you know, is very, very regular. There's a reason for everything, but some things you know, just, that's the idiom, that's the way they, they, they expressed it. Um, I mean, if you look at the, thank the you, last- Thank you very much. Okay, Bhante. Thank, thank you for raising that. Again, if we, if we look at the last Nisprahasya Trinam Jagat. Um, oh, no, look, look at the third part. Viraktasya Trinam Bhariya. The grass of the dispassionate person is his wife. 
no, come on, no, some, something's wrong there. It, it can't quite mean that. It has to mean <laughs> for the dispassionate person, his wife is no more important than grass. <laughs> I think it's probably meant to mean for all us modern people here, that uh, when it comes to the base passions, he will care not whether his wife is male or female. Of course, he will honor her and revere her as properly befits somebody of that exalted status. Yeah, actually, in Pali, uh, this kind of a, uh, problem will not happen because uh, the dative case and the possess possessive case are same, usually. Yeah, so, yes, yeah. Uh, but but uh, this is particularly happens. This particularly happens in Sanskrit. So Virakasha, actually, uh, yeah, it seems to me that dative meaning to me, bar uh, so udarasa krute turnang bitan or like that. But uh, I understand this is an idiomatic. It's just it's, it's uh, just so, the the idiom. Okay. Um, okay. And yeah, you know, re you know, if we remember, yeah, genitive is mostly for per possession of something. And the dative yes, is two yes. or four. Therefore, in English, we say four. Therefore, it must be dative. Mm. Well, yeah, the, these are just broad rules. And there are little, little refinements um, for, the, for the idiom. I'll, um, as, as time goes on, Bhante, I'll, I'll look for more examples. And I'll, I'll, I'll raise them as we, as we go, go along. Yes. Right. So any more questions arising yeah. out of that? And we can... Yeah, James, can I just ask about the Lexi Logos tool, which I believe you're using yes, please, to generate yeah. the, um, the Dave and Argery script? Mm. I, I always find, I think it's a brilliant tool. I always find that when I put in the, the Roman script, that the Dave and Argery that comes out is almost invariably uh, at odds with the style that you've got in the in Ega, Thomas and Egger's book, and also with the, in some instances, with the the style of the, of the Devanagari in the Australian National University. So do you mean the Do you mean the t t typeface? Yeah, I mean okay. the way the the style in which the uh, the Devanagari appears in the Egonus book is usually at variance with the um, the style that you get from the Lexi Logos tool. Okay, well, right. My question is: Should we take the Lex, or should I take the Lexi Logos tool really as the definitive style? No, uh, I don't. I'm going to show you why now. Okay. I put an extra bar there. So I'm going to take this line here. Um, sorry. Copy. I'm going to get into Lexilogos. Where am I going to get into it? Here we are. Here we are. Lexi Logos coming up. Lexi Logos Sanskrit. Bear with me for a moment. Okay. Yeah. You should now all see the um, Lexi Logos platform there. I'm going to um, paste. Yeah. What I've just copied. <laughs> yeah. So that was the style that you have seen. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, I didn't mean type, type, uh, the typeface style, but, um, James. I meant the actual way in which the David Argery, say, conjure variables. For instance, uh, there's a good in um, Iraq Tasia. Ah, the kta. Yeah, the chak is is different. Uh, I mean, um, in your... Yeah. It I, is. I, I, if you, I, yeah, I, if, actually, what I'm going to do, let me now copy that, copy and paste into... Here we have it here. The, oh, sorry. Yeah. It's transfer... It's Sorry, it's transposed it into um, the type my... I think it was the Mongol script. Okay, look at that. Yeah. Okay, this is the Mangal script that the Lexilogos gives you. I think it's the Mangal. Um, and there are several different typefaces you can have. So here, you're absolutely right, Chris. Look at that kt there. Yeah. yeah. You can very distinctly see the beginning part of the k put onto a t. Yeah. In this one, 
and the other typeface, it looks different. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, we, we, they're, they're both, there's more than one way of doing it. Yeah. Um, it's not always like that. There are you know, mostly whatever kind of typeface you're using and whatever style you're using, the ligatures they're called, where you join two, two consonants, consonants together, um, will appear the same in both. Yeah. But there are just, um, Several cases, and the kt is one yeah. where you you you'll see both both in use. I think in the more elegant typefaces, it's more condensed, as in you know the one I'm I'm hi highlighting here, where the, where my cur cursor is. You'll find that in in the I don't like this typeface, the Lexilogos typeface. I simply don't like it's a little bit crude, but the reason it doesn't bother me is because you can so easily change your typeface. As, as, as I do when I'm transposing it into my Word document. Yeah. So don't worry about that. They are, they are both correct. Okay. Um, and you will see occasionally, um, I'm going to see how they do it here. We had the word Akanksha. Akanksha. How do you do it? Akanksha. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Here it's written, I would say, correctly because the n and the ksh. What I'm going to do? Copy and paste into here. Sorry. B. Ah, look what's happened now. Yeah. The n has now become separated mm. because this n is written separately with a virama underneath. underneath. Whereas in the lexilogos, it has now disappeared. In the lexilogos, it was written with the n on top and the k written underneath it, yeah. which is regarded as better style and more more correct. This is just purely a case of organizing the the electronic organization of the typeface. I'm wondering whether it'll do it any better if I increase the typeface. No, it's the same. Mm -hmm. If I now change this, if I change the typeface to my favorite one, yeah, which is the um, Arial Unicode. No, yeah. it's still doing it. Mm. Oh. Does it still do it if we enlarge it? Yeah, it still does, even, yeah. even enlarge. Yeah. So this is just the, the electronics of it. The electronics of whoever did the software for this um, typeface, just mucking us about slightly. You wait to write this letter, to write an, or any other letter separately with the virama underneath. Yeah. You will normally do that only if it's really, really awkward to, to do the proper ligature. Um, I don't know why it's done it now. It, it's, this is to do with the, with the programming of the, the electronic programming of the typeface. Yeah. You will occasionally see it in printed books as well. But that may be because in old times, when they still use you know, the old-fashioned metal um, metal letters, um, either the person doing the typesetting was too too lazy to find it, or he'd run out, or or th 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 things like that. But in nice calligraphy, that would be that would be frowned on. Right. Yeah. You join join the rulers. Join them together, do the proper ligature if you possibly can, and only avoid doing it if it's if you just can't. Um, Thanks very much. That's very helpful. Thank you. Right. Um, I don't know whether to say that when we go deeper into the De Devanagari script, we're going to find it um, a rich Aladdin's cave.
or a dangerous minefield. I prefer to regard it as the Aladdin's cave. And I, I hope that you will all join me with that same, with that same approach of your heart. <laughs> so let's get rid of this now. Broom, broom. There we are. Now, for example, on this point, if you look at that sia, let me get back to iPad again. Sia. You join the S plus the year. Now, if anyone were to write in running script, say you want to write the word Asya, his. Asya. You know, that's just plain wrong. I mean, that you'd never find that. I mean, if you see that in a printed book, you know, the, the poor typesetter really had run out of the Sia ligature. So to, to take a spare set on its own, you will just ne never see, see, see that. Um, and Asti is again. You know, you just you'd never see that. Ah, that is just plain, plain wrong. It's just in the more complex ones. For the sake of convenience, the letters are separated out. And this um, unksh. This is the unksh. If you were writing very, very tiny, say I had to write really tiny, there just isn't enough space to write it. So if I had to write tiny, okay. You could write it with the virama there, simply because I'm forced to, because of the, the smallness of the space, the thickness of the pen. So you do it if you're forced to. But the rule is, if you can possibly write it as the ligature, as the combined consonants, do so. Avoid doing so only if you're forced to. But for instance, something like that, I cannot think of a situation for the sia, for example, or the st. I can't think of a situation where you could be forced to because you just run them together, however tiny. It's, it's not going to help you to make it. There's no easier to write that is no easier than to write that. So space, space wouldn't be a, a material con consideration there. But when you come to ksha, if you were to stack one up on top of the other and these complex shapes, then space can be a consideration. So that will be an excuse to separate them if you have to. In fact, I remember um, a lecturer as an, an undergraduate saying that, quite strict about that, he said, always do the ligature. If you don't do the ligature in an exam, the examiner will assume that you don't know it and you lo lose a mark for it. So these words were burnt into my mind more than half a century ago. <laughs> right, so we come now to to our um, Thomas Eginus, back to the hard grind of the lessons. For those who are new, the system that we use here is that, I'm gonna see now how many faces appear and how many faces disappear. <laughs> the system is we don't, unlike the Pali class, the Pali, somebody just disappeared. Um, in the Pali class, we're much more brutal. Nobody's allowed to escape. If you're asked to, to say something or do something, you have to. Um, the Sanskrit class, I never compel anybody to perform. I'll be asking 
individuals, so far as we have time, we haven't got very long left, to you know, read out and then translate. If you do, if you show your face, this is for the new people here, if you are showing your face, that is an indication to me that you are volunteering to be asked a question in public. If you hide your face, that is an indication. Mahin Kave, congratulations, you have shown your face. Well done, you see. <laughs> um, so, where are we? Yes, we're, the, we're at Linton sentence H. Sorry, I've lost my place now. 30, oh, yes. We're, it's the very last one on page 38. The last sentence on page 38. <laughs> and as a reward to Mahin for being brave and showing her face, Mahin, you, you, can, yes. you, you, can, do, you can do the first one. Um, the first in page 38? Yeah, no? it's page 38, and it's the last sentence, sen sentence okay. H. The H, okay. Raman Prechami. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I asked Rama. Right. That, okay, that was a bit too easy. What would it be if we ask Rama? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Ramam prich Prichamaha. Correct. And if you were talking about only two of you, we too, okay. the, the both of us are asking Rama. Uh, Ra Ramam Prichamaha. Correct. Absolutely right. Dolly, good. Thank you, Mahin. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> the next one is uh, Bob. So that would be um, number I at the top of page 39. Okay, so it's uh, Naral, Okay, we. I can hear you, but very faintly. Okay, sorry. Can you, is that a bit better? It's a little bit better. It's still on the on the faint side. How about that? Is that any better? That's a bit better, yeah. It's still faint, is it? Okay, I'll do my best. Anyway. Oh, this is this is better now. The way it's, you have it now. Okay, so uh, I is Naral Putran Navarata, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe means the the two men don't speak. To the sons. The Your belief is absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. But now, um, turn that into the. <clears throat> sorry, I didn't quite catch whether you said the sun singular or the sons plural. The, the sons uh, plural. That's yeah, correct. Now, put the men mm -hmm. into the plural. So we have narau, which is the dual. It's the two two men. Transpose that into the plural. Okay. <clears throat> so the plural would be naraha, naraha, putran, navarataha. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. You oh. put the you put the noun into the plural, but remember you've got to change the verb. Of course, that's right. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. So naraha. Uh, 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 Putran Navadanti. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah, got that right. Got it. Right. Now, next along from me is uh, Janet. Can you do J for us? I'll try. I mean, I, I, um, let's see. J, just a sec. J, Kutra. Murga, no, put K, J J J K, Kut, Kutra, yeah. Murgaha, Bavanti. Um, Kutra's where, and then the word is deer, but you would uh, where are Bavanti? I think it's the translation of are, are the deer. Yes, correct, yeah, right. Um, yes. Is that pronounced correctly? Did I pronounce it correctly? Okay, can you say, say it again? Yes, thank you. Uh, Kutra. Murgaha. Mur, 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 M
Mrigaha Bhavanti. Now, you've said it correct on the basis that you are splitting out the words called the av- avagraha, the putting the words apart without sandhi. Okay. Now, pronounce it with the sandhi correctly oh, applied. So I drop the H dot. Is that right? That's correct. Kutra Mrigaha Bhavanti. Kutra Mrigaha Bhavanti. Correct. Kutra Mrigaha Bhavanti. Why Thank does you. that subdotted H disappear? It's a rule. I don't know. It's don't a rule. Yeah, okay. That. <laughs> um, but I you would, you would, do with... you don't pass with flying colours. That answer. You kind of scrape. <laughs> you scrape through. Yes, it's a rule. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the. Is it? It must be the way that the the dot H bumps to the B. So it's uh, like a the end of the the one word bumping against the front first of the second word. But I can't recall exactly what. Yeah, it's... in the. <clears throat> In Sanskrit, of course, we don't like bumping against like a, a collision or something. It's, but it doesn't bump, bump. They merge. They're merging. Okay. So, okay. Sandhi is what happens when the words bump against each other. Very good. We can use that. I think we can bring that. They bump against each other, but they don't just make make a dent and an explosion. They merge nicely. Sandhi, <laughs> the putting putting together. The, 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 the rule is that whenever you get a word ending in an ah, and it's followed by a voiced oh, consonant yes. or a vowel, um, then that you just drop the drop the H, so which is why you have Mrigabhavanti. So, but if the deer are sitting, <coughs> it's Mriga Sidanti. It stays because of the, because of the following voice voiced um, consonant. Sorry, unvoiced consonant. However. If the following consonant is a th, then it becomes a s. So the deer are standing, be mrigas tanti, because it becomes an s before a following t. Mrigas tanti. And now I think you'll see more clearly why I don't introduce all the rules of sandhi at at one one, one go. I think it's more than the, the human mind and heart could, could, could bear. <laughs> so very good. Thank you very much. Um, you. So Christine, we're now on to the uh, English to Sanskrit. So 7A, Christine, so where is Rama going? Right. Here we go then. Let's see where I'm going. Okay. Um, Petra, I've, I've got my... With or without Sandy version. Ah, I could say Putra Brahma Gachati. Mm. Okay, and, and now and then applying Sandy. Yeah. And I could say Kutra Brahmo Gachati. Correct. That that's correct. You got that right. Kutra Ramu Gachati. Kutra Ramu Gachati. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Okay. Now would you like to put this into that that was a bit too easy. <laughs> I know you want to feel a bit more of a sense sense of achievement. So okay. where are Rama and the horse going? Hmm. Kutra Ramacha. For a mash. Yes, you got that right. Yeah. A mash, yeah. I've, I have a little, a little, um, um, a little note to myself. This is not all in the brain yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> you didn't have to tell us that because you made it look as if you did because it came, it, it came ah. out right. Ah, ah. Uh, if I am right, um, 
Kutschar Ramalscha um, Ashwo Kind of, but you now you need okay. You, I got two. You, for the cha, you you can put the cha, you can put Rama cha, Ashva, Ashvas cha, but the cha comes, you can either put two or only one, but if you put the only one cha, it comes at the end of the second word. So, Kutra Ramo Shvascha Gachata. So, Ramascha Ashvascha is correct. Okay. Or Rama Ashvascha, which by Sunday becomes Ramo Shvascha. Ramo Shvascha. Ram, Ramo, so Rama Ashvascha, Ramo Shvascha. Ramo Shvascha. Got it, yes. Uh, Gachata. Gachata, yes, right. Okay, look, sorry we didn't have time to get round everyone. Um, we will next time. So I have to cut now because the, the, the Pali class starts in just over 10, ten minutes. So, thank you all very much, and I will see you again next week. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you to thank all. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank Bye. You. Thanks.